Today, I want to talk about console-exclusive characters in fighting games. You probably ascertained that from the title, but I find this to be a really fascinating thing. Back in the arcade days, fighting games faced the issue of consoles not being able to perfectly replicate arcade hardware, so fighting games often suffered in regards to worse visuals, music, and other scattered problems like load times. Occasionally, developers would compensate for this with new features, including the addition of new characters. That's what I want to tell you guys about today. Let's look at some console-exclusive characters in fighting games. First up is Street Fighter. For this segment, I want to focus on the Alpha series, in particular Alpha 2 and 3, both of which received multiple console ports after their arcade debuts, wherein Capcom added to the roster over and over again because they just couldn't help themselves. Alpha 2's original console release was followed by an enhanced version known as Alpha 2 Gold, Street Fighter Zero Dash in Japan. Alpha 2 Gold features numerous EX versions of the existing roster, but there was one new character created specifically for this new edition of the game, Kami. Yep, the most popular of the four new challengers from Street Fighter 2 and one of the most popular SF characters period, and she was kinda just shadow dropped into Alpha 2 Gold with no fanfare. Strange. She has a new outfit and reuses sprites from X-Men vs Street Fighter where Kami also happened to be playable. Not entirely sure which one came out first, I believe it was X-Men vs Street Fighter but I can't say for certain. Anyway, Kami here pretty much has everything she did in Street Fighter Alpha 2, Spiral Arrow, Cannon Spike, Spin Knuckle, and Hooligan Flip. However, she also possesses a unique super where she summons Bison, clad in black, to perform a Psycho Crusher. She's a secret character usable only in versus mode, so have fun. The other secret Alpha 2 characters are all recolors. Shin Akuma is a powered up version of Akuma only present in the home console version. He's actually in the Super Nintendo version of Alpha 2 as well as Alpha 2 Gold and is essentially Akuma on steroids. He's juiced up with stronger properties on his moves, such as his air fireball now firing two projectiles as opposed to regular Akuma's one. He's meant to be a super beefed up boss character, so I guess it makes sense he's overpowered as fuck even compared to regular Akuma. Akuma originally started out as a boss in Street Fighter 2 and was sort of brought down to a standard level of power in the Alpha series, but I guess they just couldn't stand the thought of Akuma not being on another level of power. An alternate version of Chun-Li wearing her classic outfit from Street Fighter 2 is also valuable. She's practically the same character as standard Alpha 2 Chun-Li, but she does have a slightly different fireball. Alpha Chun's Kikoken is a half circle input, while classic Chun's is a charge input. Pretty cool. The final few characters I want to discuss are the EX characters. EX Ryu, Ken, Chun-Li, Dalsim, Zangief, Sagat, and M. Bison are the versions of the characters from Street Fighter 2 Champion Edition, and not just in the way of having modified outfits. For one, they're missing several Alpha series system mechanics. The EX characters don't have any super meters and they can't air block or perform alpha counters, recovery rolls, or throw softens. More significantly though, all of them have new move properties to match how those moves behaved in Street Fighter 2 Champion Edition. The changes are very comprehensive and make these EX characters very faithful to how the characters worked in Champion Edition. For most of them, this opens up completely new strategies and we can see that in the most interesting case, which is Zangief. In the Alpha series and all games after, Zangief's SPD has a whiff animation. When you perform the throw and it misses, Geef will fumble for a second, during which he's vulnerable to punishes. However, in Champion Edition, this doesn't exist, so a whiffed SPD will look indistinguishable from a regular jump. EX Geef carries this property over to Alpha 2, giving him the ability to perform certain option selects and tick throw setups from Champion Edition. There's tons of details like this. EX Bison's Psycho Crusher is a meterless special move, whereas Alpha 2 Bison's is a super. EX Ken's Heavy Shoryuken doesn't have the fire effect that Alpha 2 Ken does and he can't do his Tatsu in the air. EX Doll Sims Fireball knocks down while Alpha 2 Sims doesn't. They're extremely faithful. They even have different time over animations based on Champion Edition. The effort to make them as close as possible to the Street Fighter 2 versions is very appreciable. Alpha 3 now, also released on arcades and later subject to multiple console re-releases. The PlayStation version started this mess by bolstering the initial roster with DJ, Fei Long, and T-Hawk, all identical to their incarnations from Street Fighter 2, and the Dreamcast and Sega Saturn versions later added back Evil Ryu from Alpha 2 as well as Guile, completing the full Street Fighter 2 Super Turbo roster in Alpha 3, which is pretty cool. Capcom would later end up releasing an improved version of Alpha 3 for the arcades, which featured the characters added in the PS1 and Dreamcast versions, so they didn't stay console exclusive for long. The next few characters, however, are only available on consoles. In 2002, Street Fighter Alpha 3 was released for the Nintendo Game Boy Advance. A 6-button arcade game ported to a 4-button handheld. If you're wondering how well this turned out, the answer is not at all. 
Jokes aside, it's impressive that they managed to fit this game onto such a limited handheld, and not only does it contain everyone on the roster up to this point, but it also added three new characters. Yun from Street Fighter 3, Eagle from the original Street Fighter, and Maki who was from Final Fight. It may sound ambitious of Capcom to have added three completely new characters to this version of Alpha 3, but that's only because you don't know the context. As mentioned earlier, GBA Alpha 3 came out in 2002, and I'm 99% sure the only reason these three were added to it was because they previously appeared in Capcom vs SNK 2. Their movesets are practically identical to those games, the only difference is that, uh, they look just a little bit worse. Still need to see them here though. The final Alpha 3 character was added in Street Fighter Alpha 3 Max, which released for the PSP. In addition to every prior character, Max gave us Ingrid. Ingrid is interesting because she's not actually a Street Fighter character. Alright, time for some lore. Back in the early 2000s, Capcom began working on a crossover game featuring characters from their various franchises like Street Fighter, Final Fight, and Strider. The game was actually meant to debut multiple original characters that would have been integral to the story, one of whom was Ingrid. Fighting All-Stars never saw the light of day, but Capcom would later attempt to salvage the concept with a very similar game, Capcom Fighting Jam. Fighting Jam was essentially the same idea as Fighting All-Stars, a Capcom vs Capcom crossover game, but instead of one set of unifying systems and mechanics that every character in the roster adhered to, Capcom Fighting Jam essentially just ported characters over from their original games. For example, characters classed under Street Fighter Alpha and Capcom Fighting Jam have custom combos, the Street Fighter 3 characters have parrying, Darkstalkers characters can do magic series combos, Red Earth characters can do... whatever the fuck they did in Red Earth, I don't know, I haven't played that game. The fact that there's a dinosaur in the roster is hilarious though. And the Street Fighter 2 characters have one bar of super meter a la Super Turbo. Among all these rehashed characters, Ingrid was included with mechanics entirely unique to her. Well, for whatever reason, Capcom decided to include her as the last new character in Alpha 3 Max, with her moves taken straight from Capcom Fighting Jam. That's all the new characters that got added in the home console versions of Alpha 3. There's a wonderful video by Desk showing off all these characters in Alpha 2 and 3 which I recommend. I'd also like to mention that that video did inspire this one so I don't get accused of plagiarizing him. When it comes to Alpha 3 re-releases, Capcom usually sticks to the original arcade version. That's the one they chose to include in the Street Fighter 30th Anniversary Collection. It's unfortunate as it means the characters that were added in versions after have little presence in the competitive meta of the game since most people played it on the arcade back then and most people play it now online via Fightcade or the 30th Anniversary Collection, but I think it'd be cool if we ever received a definitive edition with Rollback and all the characters from Alpha 3 Max. Mortal Kombat also has a history of doing this, and there are some genuinely interesting examples across the series' history. We start all the way back at Ultimate Mortal Kombat 3. In the game's Attract mode, the character Rain made his debut in this game as a vehicle for hoaxes. The devs included him in the game's Attract mode where he could be seen fighting but he wasn't actually playable, and instead existed to fuel rumors similar to the Ermac urban legend that popped up in the days of the very first Mortal Kombat game. Well, I guess Midway just couldn't resist adding another ninja to the roster, because when Ultimate Mortal Kombat 3 was ported to the Super Nintendo and Sega Genesis, Rain was added as a playable character. Since characters in Mortal Kombat 3 share strings with others in the same body type, Rain uses the male ninja combos along with some elemental themed special moves. I think Rain is generally more known for Mortal Kombat Trilogy, where he was absolutely busted since he has an infinite, but it's cool that they snuck him into UMK3's console ports. Speaking of Trilogy, this game has a weird instance of characters hidden away on console. Obviously Trilogy was never released on arcades, but each version of the game has their own secret fighter both named Chameleon. Chameleon with a C can be found on the PS1, Sega Saturn, and PC versions, while the female Chameleon whose name is spelled with a K because Ed Boon loves that stupid wordplay is only available on the Nintendo 64 version. Chameleon and Chameleon are essentially the same concept. They both mimic existing characters on the roster and cycle between movesets every few seconds. For male Chameleon, he constantly swaps between the movesets and the male ninjas, so you'll be using attacks from Scorpion, Sub-Zero, Ermac, Reptile, Human Smoke, Rain, and Noob Cybot. Female Chameleon uses the same concept, but with the ladies, so she switches between Katana, Jade, and Melina. The funny thing about male Chameleon is that many of the characters he can switch into, like Human Smoke, Rain, and Noob, are super top tier. He switches between them fairly fast though, so you can't really take advantage of it, but it's funny to think about. Moving on to Mortal Kombat Deception, this game was released for all three 6th generation consoles, but the GameCube version released a few months after the PS2 and Xbox and did not have online play. In order to compensate for this, Goro and Shao Kahn were included as GameCube exclusive characters. 
This is pretty cool, not just because it's two new characters, but also because Goro and Shao Kahn were previously relegated to boss characters, so seeing them as standard playable characters with a more expanded moveset that isn't meant to be just a giant fuck you to players is really neat. Note that they didn't stay GameCube exclusive for long as they were included in the later PSP port of Deception known as Mortal Kombat Unchained. Nintendo once again got the preferential treatment in the next game, Mortal Kombat Armageddon. The Nintendo Wii version of the game, whose release once again was delayed compared to the PS2 and Xbox versions, included one extra character not present in the latter two, the return of the female chameleon. Once again, you can only play as her in the Nintendo version of the game, and this meant she was only available on Nintendo systems until Mortal Kombat 1 when she was added as a cameo fighter. Personally, if I was NRS, I would have made Chameleon exclusive to the Switch version of the game to maintain tradition, but oh well. The final MK character I want to discuss is from Mortal Kombat 9. It was released for the Xbox 360, PC, and PS3. For the PS3 version, and also the PS Vita version that came out later, Kratos from the God of War series was added as an exclusive guest character, presumably due to the massive success of God of War 3 which had come out a year prior. Kratos is pretty faithful to his home series. He's got his Blades of Chaos and it comes with some heavy hitting attacks, while his special moves are based on the weapons that he obtains in God of War 3 like the Head of Helios and Hermes Boots. I also love the move that pulls up a quick time event to perform a follow up for more damage, just like in the God of War games. His major issue is that he's really, really slow. However, in the grand scheme of things, he's not bad. You might be curious about how well he did in tournaments, but there's no data to report because Kratos was usually banned from tournament. The reason for this ban is completely centered around his console exclusivity. The tournament standard for Mortal Kombat 9 was apparently the Xbox 360 version, so obviously Kratos wouldn't be available, but even if the standard was PlayStation 3, think about what that means. Anyone who did not own MK9 on PS3 or Vita had no way to practice the Kratos matchup. DLC is one thing, anyone can purchase them regardless of system, but having to shell out hundreds of dollars for a console port just to practice against one character? That's kinda silly. It's kind of unfortunate actually, since Kratos is actually a really neat character, but it also makes me curious how Kratos would be handled if MK9 was ever re-released for modern consoles. Would they include Kratos on all consoles? Or remove him? Maybe add another character with the same moves? Who knows. Kratos also came with his own unique stage that was also banned. You might wonder why a stage would be banned when it should theoretically function the same as every other, but this stage would actually cause the screen to shake, which is hella disorienting. You might be able to find articles saying that Sweet Tooth from the Twisted Metal series was considered to be used in Kratos' place, but the only thing that really substantiates it is a very vague tweet from Ed Boon where he states that he was close to becoming a guest character in MK without specifying which game he might have joined. He also used this very vague method to confirm that Marcus Phoenix was also a potential candidate to join the roster of Mortal Kombat 9, and since that series is owned by Microsoft, he would presumably be Xbox 360 exclusive. Tatsunoko vs. Capcom is one of the most underrated fighting games of all time. It's so damn sick, and I really hope for it to become playable with rollback sometime. On to the topic of the video though, TVC was originally an arcade game like many of the games I've discussed thus far. For some reason Capcom was intent on making this the definitive Wii fighting game because that was the only console it was ever ported to. The Wii port of Tatsunoko vs. Capcom received four new characters. Saki Omokane from Quiz Nanairo Dreams. It's a dating sim quiz hybrid apparently. I won't ask. Joining her is Beautiful Joe, Ipatsuman, and Hakushun Daimo. Seems all well and good, but the thing is, even the Wii version of TVC was exclusive to Japan. No one outside of that region got to play it until 2010, when high fan demand caused the game to get brought to North America and Europe. For these purposes, a new version of the game known as TVC Ultimate All-Stars was created, which added 5 new characters. On the Tatsunoko side, we got Yatterman 2, Tekemen Blade, and Joe the Condor. I don't know anything about these characters, so I have literally nothing to say. On a significantly more interesting note, the Capcom side was bolstered with Zero and Frank West, preceding their playable appearances in Marvel vs. Capcom 3. Zero is fairly similar all things considered. It's obviously not one to one, but he's got a lot of familiar stuff, such as the infamous Sogenmu super that haunts the dreams of all Marvel 3 players. Frank on the other hand... Whew. Well, for one, he looks real strange in this game. I get major Nico Bellic vibes from this guy. 
For two, his playstyle is fairly different. In UMBC3, he fights using a bunch of tools and a level up system that utilizes his camera. He still has his bevy of tools, but the level up system is completely gone. He does have more moves that uses zombies and also the real Mega Buster, which is still fucking hilarious, especially with three other Mega Man characters on the roster. These five came at the cost of Hakushin Daimo, who was cut from Ultimate All Stars. Heartbreaking, I know. The Tekken series, having had a much longer lasting presence in arcades than other big fighting game series like Street Fighter, has had its fair share of roster additions meant to provide an enhanced console experience. In Tekken 4, Miharu Hirano and Eddie Gordo were added to the PlayStation 2 version of the game as unlockable skins for the characters Zhao Yu and Christy. They both share the same movesets, so the only difference is aesthetics. Do you want to play as the annoying flippy capoeira man or woman? The choice is yours. In the PS3 version of Tekken 5 Dark Resurrection, Jinpachi Mishima was made playable after being a boss character in the arcade and PSP versions. The most interesting console-only characters in the Tekken series, however, come from Tekken 3. 3 is arguably the most acclaimed game in the series, and its massive success in the arcades gave way to a PS1 port that was equally as successful, becoming one of the flagship games for the system. The PS1 version comes with two new characters that are a level of silly you don't typically see, at least whenever the series isn't including two bears who know martial arts for eight games in a row. The first is Dr. Boskinovich. Dr. B is not much for combat, so he fights mostly by means of flopping around like a jackass. He can hardly stand up for 5 seconds before falling to the ground. Not very good at fighting, but highly endearing and entertaining. He'd later return in Tekken Tag Tournament 2, which features a bunch of console exclusive characters as well, but I digress. The other home port addition to Tekken 3, and maybe the greatest character to ever grace the series, is Gone. You can probably tell just from his aesthetics, but Gone is not a Tekken character. He originates from a manga with which he shares a name. I don't know why he's in this game, but if you ever wanted to play as a little orange dino gremlin who farts, then here we go. I think Gone Mirror Matches in Tekken Ball might be the most unserious thing in the Tekken series? Also, I believe Tekken 3 has never been re-released on modern consoles, and licensing issues with Gone is the likely culprit. To finish this video off, I want to discuss Soul Calibur 2. When it comes to arcade games releasing on home consoles and receiving new characters, I think Soul Cal 2 is the most well-known example. The game released on the GameCube, PS2, and Xbox, and each of these versions of the game got their own exclusive guest character, but before any of them, we have Necrid. Necrid was an original character created specifically for the home ports, and he's on all three systems. Don't have much to say because he's kind of generic, but hey, there you go. Now for the three guest characters. If you're on the Xbox, you'd get access to Spawn. This pick immediately sticks out as weird, since Spawn obviously isn't owned by Microsoft and could have been on either of the other two versions of the game. I wonder if this had to do with the fact that Spawn was created by Todd McFarland, who was the person that designed Necrid. I guess the only other choice for a Microsoft character at the time was, like, Master Chief? I don't know, either way, I guess it's cool to see him here. He fights using an axe, and he is neat to see in action. One thing I find funny is that he would later appear in Mortal Kombat 11 as a guest character, and the difference in detail is quite apparent. Also, this makes him the second guest character to appear in both MK and Soul Calibur after Kratos. For the PS2 folks, we have Heiachi Mishima from the Tekken series. This is another strange pick. It's a bit weird that Namco just chose a character from their other fighting game series, especially when the character Yoshimitsu has appeared in entries in both series and wasn't a highly advertised guest like Heihachi was. I think when it comes to guest characters, most people find it more exciting when it's a character from a non-fighting game. Also, Heihachi fights with his fists, and Soul Calibur is the weapon fighting game. Well, if you were thinking he wasn't the developer's first pick, you'd be right. Originally, they intended to have Cloud Strife from Final Fantasy VII join the fight. Makes more sense as Square Enix had mostly been releasing games for the PlayStation since the 90s, and he would have been a good fit for the game, but he was cut. The deal with Square fell through at the very last minute, which was confirmed by Nao Higo, a localization producer who worked on the game during the 8-4 Play podcast in 2017. What likely happened is that Namco just ended up using a Tekken character since they had immediate access to that series. An interesting thing to note is that when Soul Calibur 2 was re-released for Xbox Live and PSN in 2011, Heihachi and Spawn were included in both versions, regardless of console. The same cannot be said for the GameCube's guest character, Link. You come to town. Link from the Legend of Zelda series. Whenever I hear boomers who played Soul Calibur 2 back in the day talk about it, they cite Link as the main reason why the GameCube version was the best, and honestly, I can see that. The novelty of seeing Link in a fighting game that isn't Smash Brothers must have been hella cool. Link fights using his sword and a bunch of items he typically uses in the Zelda series, like bombs, arrows, and boomerangs. 
Obviously, Link wasn't included in Soul Calibur 2 HD, seeing as how he's a Nintendo character. When it comes to tournaments, these characters suffered a similar fate as Kratos in Mortal Kombat 9. All three of them are usually banned in the interest of fairness along with Necrid. To be honest, I think this kind of summarizes why I'd hate this kind of stuff. Even if it likely did boost Soul Calibur 2's popularity in the market, especially amongst casuals, not being able to play as a character just because he's not available in other versions of the game, thus making him unavailable to two thirds of the player base, sounds really annoying. However, there is an alternative. Soul Calibur 2 Plus is a modification of the GameCube version which allows all three guest characters to be played as. It's a really cool mod and the only reason I was able to get footage of Spawn. I'll leave a link to the Discord for Soul Calibur 2 as well as the Soul Cal 2 modding cord in the description. Do check it out if you're interested. Now this is normally where I'd end things off, but let's talk about one more silly instance of this shit happening in the series. Soul Calibur 4 has a very puzzling instance of console exclusive characters. The game, for whatever reason, featured guest characters from the Star Wars series. The Apprentice, the main protagonist of Star Wars The Force Unleashed, was playable along with Darth Vader and Yoda. Puzzlingly, the two were separated initially and only playable on a specific console. Vader was locked to PS3 and Yoda was 360. I can understand Link, Heihachi, and Spawn, but why were these two console exclusive? It makes no sense and the only justification I can think of is Namco attempting to encourage people to buy both versions. Both characters were banned in tournament due to this and Namco eventually decided to make them available on all consoles. Vader was released as DLC for the Xbox 360 version and Yoda was DLC on the PS3 version. Kinda sucks for people who purchased both versions for the sake of having both characters, but oh well. Oh and guess what? They were both delisted after a bit of time. Thanks, Disney. So that's it for this video. I had a ton of fun making it and learning about some of these characters. Many of these series I don't typically dabble into, so I'm glad I was able to talk about them and teach you guys something you might not have known. Let me know if you enjoyed it, and thank you for watching. Have a great night, and take care.